So, good morning. In this next lecture, I would like to give you an overview about focal liver lesions and especially in reference to tropical infectious disease. So that means basically looking at abscesses and cysts. Of course, the focal liver lesions <clears throat> are a very interesting um, chapter in, in, in liver ultrasound, particularly so because they are a bit easier to identify because always the, the lesion can be compared to the surrounding normal liver tissue. When can we start to see focal pathologies? That depends on the difference in echogenicity. If they, if they are significantly different from the surrounding tissue, they might be visible when very small, say smaller than half a centimeter. Um, when, they are, when they blend in more to the tissue, then of course you need larger lesions to see them. Basically, when they are subcapsular, they can cause external bulging of the liver capsule. They can cause displacement of hepatic vessels. And of course, they can cause obstruction of intrahepatic bile ducts and local dilatation of the bile ducts. The differential diagnosis of focal liver lesions is wide. And um, infection, as you can see, plays one role. And of course, in tropical countries, it plays maybe a more significant role. But in general, there are malformations, that are normal cysts, sequelae of trauma, like hematomas, neoplasms, benign, malignant. And then, of course, cirrhotic livers pose another problem because they are like multiple nodes, can, can be seen as multiple regenerative nodes. And then, of course, there are a few others like patchy distributions of fat or low fat calcifications. Anyway, what we will look at first, because that is um, that is also a significant problem in the tropics, is the sequelae of trauma. That's hematomas, liver hematomas. You you'll find in the in the case of acute bleeding, you'll find hypoechoic areas like here with a bit of a torn border, and this hypoechoic stuff is obviously blood. With the time when this blood coagulates, it becomes more echodense, more echogenic. There can be differentiated three categories, ruptures of the liver and the capsule. That is, of course, something where you will see blood as well in, the, in your FAST scan. Subcapsular hematomas, we will look at one example in another lecture. And central ruptures, which are more in, in the central areas. But that is luckily not the most common thing to see. The most common finding, focal finding in the liver is probably the non-parasitic dysontogenetic cyst. This is an anechoic, well-defined, has no wall, is completely black, is usually round, has an, the, the artifact of an dorsal acoustic enhancement. The right lobe is affected twice as often. Okay, that's wisdom from the books, because roughly everything is more, is more common in the right lobe, so it doesn't really help you much. But uh, well, it's written, so I want, don't, I want to share this key information with you. They might be isolated or multiple. Well, surprise, surprise. And what is maybe more... Interesting, if you have patients with a polycystic kidney disease, they are often have also uh, multiple cysts of the liver. That's something maybe that is not as well known. How do these cysts live in moving picture? This is a large cyst here in, in uh, the right liver lobe, as expected, as described. You see, it is large. It is... Um, completely anechoic, it has this dorsal shadow. Here we have a smaller version of its kind, or these are even multiple, I think. There is a cyst, another cyst, another cyst. So these are not completely round, you see it's a bit irregular. But in the end you can clearly see that these are cysts. The Trouble with the cysts is that you want to differentiate them from these guys, and that are echinococcal cysts, parasitic cysts. Um, again, in echinococcal disease, the majority of the cyst is located in the liver. They are thicker walled and um, may have even some small amounts of calcification in the wall. Some of them, and we'll look at that, have this honeycomb appearance, which we see here. Then, of course, it is easy to differentiate it from a normal cyst. And um, you might see cyst in cyst phenomena. I'll show you what that is in a minute. Let's look at <clears throat> the epidemiology of hydatate disease first. While it has a worldwide distribution, also it is there has definitely a different prevalence in different areas. Cattle rising, here we have the sheep, and here we have the well, obviously the sheep dog. 
are have a especially high prevalence. They are found in eastern and northeastern Africa, Mediterranean area, but also in South America. The definite host is the dog, and the dog sheds the eggs. And the sheep get infected, or we can get as an as an accidental host infected and have then the cyst in the different tissue of our body. As mentioned, the main organ is the liver. Lung is also possible. Here we see that cysts in the liver, then in the lungs, probably the second most common, and then in or other organs like spleen, peritoneum. Here you see, um, I get this picture from Eberhard Seile, who works with, an, with AMREF in Kenya, where they have the, the epidemiological hotspot, you might say, in the Turkana, where the farmers live very close with their dogs. And obviously they have a very high infection rate. And um, normally, not in these farmers, but normally you have uni, unilocular hepatic cysts. The, the complaints are usually right upper quadrant pain. Ascites might be jaundice due to biliary obstruction. There is generally, and that is an interesting, no eosinophilia. There is the reflex when you think of worms, you think of eosinophilia, but that's not always the case and not so in Heidelberg disease, so there is no eosinophilia. Serology might help you. It is positive in a quite significant number in patients with liver disease. You can find the cyst by ultrasound, obviously, and the WHO working group has classified this cyst, and this is a, there are various different classification systems, and I guess Enrico will do a little bit on that. Well, we, we look at them in detail. Just remember there are 1C1, C2, C3, and then C4, C5, and the C3 might be differentiated between A and B. But we look at that in detail. CE1 is a completely anechoic with a localized thickening of the wall. So what you can sometimes, you can see it here in the background, and here you can see the double layer of the, of the cyst, which you never have in a, in a normal liver cyst. So that, but that definitely is the most difficult one to differentiate from a normal cyst. Serology might help here a bit. The next I pointed CE3A, and you will see why I'm not sticking to a one, two, three in, in a later slide. So this is in the next cyst, and maybe this is the best example. You can see that this inner cyst is detached from the outer cyst, so there is basically a, a membrane floating inside the cyst. Then we have this typical honeycomb image that would be a CE2, the fluid collection with the daughter cyst. Here is a good example, here another one. Then when the, the cystic material slowly becomes consolidated and it develops a heterogeneous echo pattern with both echogenic and hypoechoic areas, so that would be CE3B, and then it completely consolidates CE4. It's an heterogeneous with mainly hyperechoic, so it's mainly condensed. An example of this, this is a got this picture from Enrico from the University of Padua. This is the ultrasound picture and was operated, so this is how it would look then in the anatomical preparation. So it is mainly solid stuff. And in the end, it will d develop a calcification cyst, basically, uh, with a shadow. That would be a CE5 cyst. Why, why did I not stick to the numbering? But what people think is that the, the natural cause of disease is th this. In the beginning, you have a CE1 cyst, that's young echinococcal cyst. Then, with the, um, the immune system or albendazole treatment or whatever, it, it favors the side of the host. The inner cyst gets detached, it slowly consolidates, and eventually calcifies. So, the natural desired course is CE1, CE3A, 4, 5. Unfortunately, it can go from here to here. Then, it can develop the CE2 picture where multiple daughter cysts, when the, the worm gets the upper hand again. This can then go from here to here, where again it, it becomes more consolidated, less viable. And of course, there are also tracks, unfortunately, from 4 back to 3, 3B possible. So, and as a proof of that, I want to show you, show you this serial exam. This is a patient with a 3A cyst, and then it slowly, this is after nine months, it consolidates, so this would almost completely solid. And then by the time here, another year later, 
it is completely consolidated. So this would be a C forces that hopefully, or maybe even C5 throws shadow starts to calcify. So this is the natural course and the desired. We have to be careful with uh, differentials and that is septate. There are sometimes two cysts next to each other or septated cysts. Okay. These are normal cysts that should not be confused with echinococcal cysts just because they have one septa. And another uh, or important thing is that um, if you have um, if you have even minor traumas, it can into it can cause bleeding into liver normal liver cysts. So this bleeding, when once the blood coagulates, causes this irregular irregular structures. And, and this, so this in the in the echogenic material here is coagulated blood. So that's obviously not are not daughter cysts. They are too irregular. That's not a echinococcal cyst. That's a hematoma into a normal liver cyst. So then let us move to the next parasite and this pictures I'd like to thank Dr. Adnan Kavalioglu from Turkey who sees probably most and has most of the experience in ultrasound in fasciola. Fasciola is the, the liver fluke. Here you can see it. The, the young flukes are well smaller and the adult flukes are surprise, surprise bigger. The fluke has quite a lifespan. It most commonly in sheep, so sheep again, it has a rather complicated travel path in the host body. And I'll, I'll show you that. Basically, again, we are accidental hosts when we eat plants growing close to the water where sheep graze. So basically, the, the, the sheep drops the egg, it passes through the snail, and then it, it um, attaches to the water plants. If they are eaten like watercress in England, it might cause fasciola disease. Where does it happen? Well, and here you can see there are endemic regions which are well known in, in, in Europe. So France, Portugal, England, as I mentioned, watercress, always the, the, the culprit there. Then Turkey, of course, that's where Adnan comes from. But then we have some hyper endemic regions that is um, here in Peru, Bolivia, Egypt, Iran, Chile and Cuba. So patients from these places where we have to think about fasciola. What will be the clinical picture that uh, when we have to think about it? And I think the, the best description, what Adnan gave me once, he said, um, the, you should think about fasciola when the surgeons come to you and say, well, we, we think this guy has cholecystitis, but we took the gallbladder out already and we, he still has the same symptoms. Have you an idea? So it is this cholecystitis, uh, right upper quadrant pain, fever, fatigue, uh, loss of appetite, weight loss. So the same like um, cholecystitis, but it is not cholecystitis. How can we differentiate it? Well, obviously by ultrasound, but you have to be aware that you're not only looking at the gallbladder, but that you look at the liver as well. And in the liver, you might find in fasciola multiple liver lesions, confluent, size you know, one to three centimeters, no major vascularity, can be seen in ultrasound, obviously in CT. You can realize that the, the, the lesions are starting from the capsule. So that's, that is about the path that I wanted to talk about, what the worms do. They perforate the bowel, they get into the peritoneum and they re-enter the liver through the capsule and then dig their way towards the biliary system. It's a bit of a detour, but well, the worm likes it. So this is what, where it starts, and then it, it moves towards the more central area. It is a bit ill-defined. Then they might, of course, form these linear tracts here. This is a very nice CT scan, it's not an ultrasound, but anyway, it explains, it explains or it demonstrates the principle, they, the, the footpath of the worms towards the biliary system where they finally want to be. Can, of course, not be really differentiated from an abscess, from a necrosis. You have to think about fasciola. Can also simulate a metastasis. Here in this case, you see these hypoechoic, more roundish lesions, which um, turned out to be fasciola and not metastatic liver disease. When the worm finally reached the gallbladder, you might see a floating, moving worm. Well, obviously, if it's a young worm, a smaller, it's an adult worm, three to four centimeter size object swimming in the gallbladder, and this is where he wants to be. And um, well, then, of course, it's not a focal liver lesion anymore, but it can still cause trouble because if these worms, they, they behave like gallstones when they displace into the bile ducts, they might cause common bile duct dilatation, ectoros, and, and, and problems in the biliary system, which we don't 
actually not want to talk about right now. A few hints from clinical side because you always should see your ultrasound picture in, in combination to the clinical probabilities. Well, the lab shows you the beginning, I would say, is what it shows you in cholecystitis. And here, luckily, we have the eosinophilias. I have in the back of my brain now, if I see a cholecystitis with eosinophilia, I want to think about fasciola. There is serology that helps you then to prove to your surgeon that it might not be cholecystitis only. Question, looking for eggs in the stool. Parasites always shed eggs in the stool. Does it make sense? Uh, yes and no. In the acute stage, when you have the trouble, it doesn't make sense because the worm is not yet has not yet arrived at his place of living, so it, it's that you won't find eggs in the in the stool. Treatment: triclabendazole is effective if you can get your hand on it. And now we have to look at one disease that is far more common than both of the the previous together. That is amoebic abscess. Around eight percent of the patients with amoebiasis develop hepatic abscesses, and a large share of, pop of the world's population is infected with amoeba. It is more common in adults than children, more common in men than women. And from animal studies, we know that the amoeba can cause a significant necrosis within days after arrival in, of, in the liver. And this explains the really abrupt onset, the acute onset of, of symptoms of, of, of pain, of fever in patients with um, amoebic liver abscess. So most often there is a single lesion and, as usual, more frequent in the right liver lobe and, and most, most commonly in the posterior segment. What might give you a clue that there is an amoebic liver abscess is this elevated hemidiaphragm on, on the chest x-ray. Can you, what can you see in, in an amoebic abscess in the liver? Well, the, there is, of course, this liquefaction necrosis, which causes the anchovisos if, if you puncture it. It has, a, it has no actual walls. It is, in general, hypoechoic. When you treat it appropriately with, with metronidazole mainly, first change its um, appearance and then shrink. And, well, aspiration is possible, though it is actually rarely indicated, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. What you could do once you aspirate to look microscopically for amoeba, but um, it is very, very cumbersome, and we do not usually do it. So let's have a look at the picture. Here it is. It's a round structure, again, not maybe not completely anechoic, but very, very echo-poor, no proper wall, a round shape, and uh, localized in the right liver lobe. Once you start treating with um, a metronidazole, you can see here it becomes from this lesion, very typical location, to this one, more hypoechoic, more black. So that's a sign that you're treating the right thing. And then let's have a look at this in... And an ultrasound. This is the liver, and you can see this is the kidney. Here is a one, another two focal lesions. Mm. It's a patient from South Africa who came with a fever and and right upper um, quadrant pain. Now I'm struggling a bit, but with the ribs. But here again, you can see at least two lesions. What you can do? This is now the second, the same patient. You can see you can find yourself a way where you can easily we have a nice access then you can see here the needle coming and um, you can aspirate some material and you will find this anchovy sauce you see that it is not pus that is the most important thing and, and also if i aspirate i would always send this to microbiology but not for microscopy but for culture just to make sure that in case there is anything growing then I have um, secured the bacterial origin. The amoebic, I do not necessarily need to find. I can as well treat without knowing exactly. Good. What is the treatment? Well, basically, this is an interesting study. It compares smaller abscesses which were treated with drugs alone with the larger abscesses that were treated with a needle aspiration plus drugs and smaller abscesses which failed. And they found basically what they found is that the, if you treat with needle with with the um, drainage, the um, mean time to clinic improvement and the mean hospital stay is shorter. So they conclude needle aspiration combined with um, anti-amoebic drug is more effective than drug treatment alone. Obviously, if you look at three days, seven days, and this minor improvement and and the risk, if you are not um, if you are not an expert or experienced in, in puncturing, you might as well say, okay, but 
then I can as well treat three days longer and, and I have the same outcome. I think the conclusion from this study depends on, on your point of view before, before the study. Another interesting uh, report from Belgium, they had a patient with multiple amoebic liver abscesses, 25, that's, that's of course very rare, and she did not dispond, respond to medical treatment, but then after they drained the larger ones, And maybe you have a serology, start him on metronidazole and see after, after two, three days, he will become better relatively quickly. And then you do not need to aspirate, neither for diagnostics nor for, for treatment. The big um, differential of amoebic abscesses is, of course, hepatic pyogenic abscesses. This is the most common form of liver abscess in Europe. It is mainly caused by gram-negative bacteria. It has usually a slower clinical onset. It's not so acute like, like amoebic disease. Patients often have risk factors like abdominal surgery, abdominal trauma, maybe ERCPs, uh, some um, infection of the biliary tree or diverticulitis that are secondary and then secondary liver abscess, immunocompromised patients. So that is, um, that is a different, let's say, patient population than the one amoebic abscess. But obviously they overlap. I mean, that's, that's clear. So that, that poses a problem. So we need to look at ways to differentiate between the two and one you can already see in the CT scan gram-negative bacteria might cause gas bubbles so that is a that is important amoeba never cause gas bubbles. so what how can how is can we differentiate them on the ultrasound picture well pyogenic abscesses are have a more variable shape and size they have usually irregular walls they are can be anechoic to highly echogenic, so that's not really a, a differentiation criteria. The majority is less echogenic than liver, but what, what I mentioned already are the gas bubbles, and well, here that's the reason maybe why you want to do a needle aspiration, because then you can send it to microbiology, as I mentioned, and get a culture done. This is a typical pyogenic liver abscess. You can see this irregular, it's, it's different from the from the round amoebic ones, I think. And you can see here in the upper end, you can see this echogenic little gas bubbles with a little bit of shadow. More difficult to differentiate from, um, this is again in the right liver lobe, a, a, a round abscess, more homogenic, but again, this is a pyogenic um, abscess in an old man after um, colonic cancer surgery. This is now the Third one, and maybe the, if, if somebody shows you this and says, "Oh, I got this," um, it is an amoebic abscess. I would not, um, I would not be able to argue about it. Just knowing that this this old lady has never been in the tropics, um, I know, and, and from the treatment, I know that it is uh, again a pyogenic abscess. But you cannot really differentiate from by imaging criteria alone. Let's look at some of these in motion. So here we have this this. Um, Gentleman with the irregular, and you see the gas bubbles, you see these dirty shadows, as we call it. They're not really perfect shadow, not, not, not blackening out the, the image, but they cause this, the gas bubbles cause this dirty shadow. Here. You see this completely irregular, it's more like a map of a country, the borders. Then we have this lady, and as I said, this is a bit more, yeah. And moving picture, it looks a bit less suspicious of amoebic, but it could be. I mean, there is no, as I said, if you, if somebody tells you this is an amoebic, but this is after we punctured it. And you can see that little remains, and obviously it was pus, and um, it was um, it grew bacteria. And that is um, a study that Enrico did. In the 90s, the, if you puncture it, it is the and, and you you culture the pus. The positivity to find um, bacteria is is much higher in the pus than in the blood culture. So while if even if you draw four to six blood cultures, you will get 40 percent yield the causative organism, and uh, the pus is is a much more direct way to the pathogen. And also you'll find more often you'll find that there are multiple bacteria involved. What are the, the tr treatments? 
options here and of course there is the percutaneous drainage it's a logical thing most very often these these patients are old and frail so the percutaneous approach is a, is a good one in this study they drained 54 liver abscesses and they concluded um, that that ultrasound guided percutaneous drainage is reliable and effective approach and i think that is true i can only confirm that what i think is very interesting is this study from hong kong where they looked at the difference between catheter drainage with the pigtail catheter and intermittent needle aspiration because the trouble is with the pigtail you have an, a tube going into the patient that then you send them to the ward in secondary infections might and chew and it might be blocked it needs to be flushed it needs a bit of handling so what they looked at is to, to intermittently aspirate simply by stick a needle in, aspirate as much as you can, and then maybe do that um, several times, but do not leave the catheter inside. And they found that um, the needle group was even associated with a higher treatment success, a shorter hospital stay, and lower mortality rate, also not significant. I think that is a very good approach, especially in the rural and the, in the remote setting, because you you don't have this this trouble with the nurses caring for a, a tube which they do not really know what it does, where it goes, blocking and and the secondary infection. So I think it is a very useful way, and well, in in South Africa at least, I preferred this way to pigtail drainage. Then another infection which is very has a very very global epidemiology. The most common is zoonosis worldwide, with half a million cases each year. That is brucellosis. It is um, very common around the Mediterranean area and in the Middle East. Again, this is associated with cattle farming. And um, the, the hotspot is Syria and the, and, and the Central Asian countries, Mongolia. But it also exists here in Peru. The, the usually it presents with a it's it's a systemic disease with which resembles tuberculosis most with the B symptoms, anorexia, weight loss, night sweats, fever. But then focal symptoms may occur. That is well known, and maybe the best known organ is the are the osteoarticular lesions and the and the lower back pain, sacroiliac joints. But um, what is maybe less well known is that brucella abscesses in liver and spleen are rare but occur at a, at, at a certain frequency. We did a literature review a couple of years ago and we found that in studies with retrospective or prospective prevalence data there, was, there are approximately 2,500 patients investigated and in 21 of them there are, they have abscesses. So that is about a rate of 1%. 1 so in 1% of the patient you will find liver abscesses, more frequent, 0.8%, and or spleen abscesses, 0.4%. So it is rare, but it exists. And I mention it because um, it has a relatively distinct ultrasound pictures because what makes you think of, um, of Brucella abscess is this central um, calcification, which is present in approximately 80% of the of the patients. So that is a very typical, you can see it on a CT scan again, this is this central nidus of calcification that should give alert you to the idea, oh I've seen that before in Peru, I should think about brucella. Again another example, you see in hypoechoic round lesion with a central echogenic um, focus, another one here smaller ones, the, hypo, the hypoechoic area is not as well visible, only the calcification, but on CT scan then, it nicely, the brucella abscess. How will we, I mean, obviously, you know, if you just see it, you want a little bit more solid data to support your diagnosis, serology, the Coombs test is, is the test of choice. Culture is rarely positive. With the modern automated technique, it, it becomes a bit... Better, so blood culture and culture of the pus, if you aspirate, are possible. Probably also PCR is a good option, but it is not widely reported. Treatment would be combinations of doxycycline plus rifampicin, both for six weeks, alternative doxycycline combination with streptomycin. Then a few other rarer things or minor things, fungal abscesses. They often have a particular appearance, that is this wheel-in-wheel appearance that you can see here 
it's, it's basically a ring and then a, 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 a hypoechoic ring surrounded by an uh, surrounding an echogenic ring and then a central necrotic hypoechoic area again. Mainly an immunocompromised host. Very often they, they are um, multiple and they are often small in size. As you can see here, this is the liver and you see this tiny abscess. And I, I zoomed it out. Yeah, these are fungal HIV patients. Neutropenic patients are the ones where you want to think about that. Then TB can cause liver abscesses and I'll talk about that in more detail later in a later lecture. Mycobacterium avium in HIV patients is of course um, is of course a, a cause of, of liver abscesses of tiny more, more often smaller and, and less ne necrotic um, abscesses then very rare and more for the for the books this is a patient with a syphilitic liver abscess that um, that Enrico had uh, and that was um, diagnosed on autopsy he died due to other reasons and then they found that this is syphilitic then in patients from Southeast Asia, you might to think might want to think about melioidosis, which is um, due to Burkholderia pseudomyeloi. This causes again causes a TB-like systemic picture, and and also can cause um, focal lesions in spleen and 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 liver. With the this abscess is often filled with blood-stained bacteria. As mentioned, you want to think about it in patients from Southeast Asia. That was basically the infectious differential diagnosis, but I have at least, we have to briefly look at the non-infectious, the, the two most common, and that is the hemangioma and the metastasis. I want to give you some information about because obviously also in the tropics you have non-tropical diseases. The hemangioma is the most common benign tumor. It is a highly echogenic and well-defined lesion. It is in typical hemangiomas you can you just see it and it's diagnosed simply by by the look of it. And sometimes you can might even see the feeding feeding vessel. So let's have a look at this typical hemangioma. It is a very, you see, this is the liver, and then this, there is this very bright, shiny, small, not completely round, but yeah, looks looks not very dangerous. This is a this is a typical hemangioma. Here's another one. It's from South African patient. It's a, I think there is one here, smaller one, and there is a bigger one above. Which is not as it is. It may, may be a little bit less echogenic towards the center, but it is a very round, well defined, very sharp um, tumor. And in this case, you could see with a um, with a Doppler, you can see the feeding. There, there is the the echogenic tumor, and there is the feeding vessel. You can see here constantly with a constant flow but you don't have to see that this is more yeah if you see one then take a video clip and show it to show it to others but that's of course just a benign disease which you need to know so that you don't cause any trouble to the don't trouble the patient with a suspicion of something malignant but metastases of the liver are, of course, more important. They are the most common form of neoplastic involvement of the liver. Metastases are, well, obviously often multiple, um, visible around a centimeter, as I mentioned, depending on their echogenicity. They might have irregular blurred margins. They, they bulge the surface of the liver if they are subcapsular, and they may, of course, displace the vessels. There are different patterns. They might be hypoechoic, they might be anechoic, even they might be echogenic. They might have these halo sign, the bull's eye sign, which can remind you of a fungal abscess. Um, but in the end, all these patterns appear, but they are not really, it's not that you can say from the pattern which type of tumor it is. Here's an example of hypoechoic metastasis, not all different sizes. That is a typical thing. Here is one next to a vessel. And um, again, hypoechoic. Let's have a look at the video clip again. Yeah, let's see, this is um, multiple hypoechoic lesions, all different size in the liver. I'll play it again. 
this is the best part. Let's see. Not a, this is a typical metastatic liver disease. And another example. Again, this this different sizes. And there's a gallstone, but that's certainly not the patient's problem. And um, I think the image is clear, bigger ones, smaller ones, confluent, others, single. Mm. Uh, the usual primary site, if you see metastasis, you want to think about the gastrointestinal tract, of course, particularly the colonic cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. As I mentioned, the ultrasound appearance lack any specificity or defining the organ of origin. Uh, what you can do is, you, when you treat the patients with chemotherapy, you can follow up the changes of the lesions of whether they are shrinking, whether your treatment is working. But that is, um, yeah, that is a different story. So, in general, let me summarize. I think focal pathologies are ambiguous, and you are, once you find something that is always exciting, you have, but you have to consider symptoms and clinical plausibility. What um, what can be the cause of this? So with this, I would like to stop here and show you some focal, a focal spot near to Sudan. Thank you.